It's one of the world's most critical needs, food. And I'm gonna buy some tomatoes, strawberries, nectarines, peaches. And it's linked to our environment, our society, and undeniably our health. Is California on the leading edge of food safety? Absolutely. It defines who we are and how we live. People always say, you are what you eat. And for many, food is a source of fear and concern, optimism and potential. We're helping the industry improve the quality of food. That potential is obvious when you step foot on the University of California, Davis, home to groundbreaking research that's finding answers to global issues surrounding our food supply. From the safety of it, to the future of it, to what we should be doing with it right now. In this half hour, we hear from those on the front lines of research that may well end the spread of foodborne illness. This is actually the machine that we do the DNA fingerprinting on. Those who wish it would have come earlier. We came close to losing Regan. I can't imagine how much more difficult our life would have been. And those like celebrity chef and UC Davis graduate Martin Yan. Uh, spring onion, I have beets, I have celery. And California Food and Agriculture Secretary Karen Ross. I love to tell people that if they had a salad today, at least half of those ingredients came from California. Who say, thanks to innovation happening right here at UC Davis, California is poised to lead the country and feed the world. Yeah, see they have a blower and it's blowing air and scaring the insects away and stuff like that. So it's, so the product comes out about as clean as you can. It's birds, you got birds. When Bob Martin started farming decades ago, he never imagined he'd be so concerned with what's growing alongside his produce. We treat every pile of poop uh, like it could harbor a, a pathogen. We gotta make sure that that, uh, that doesn't cross over into commerce, into, the, into, into our product. Sounds like a joke, but it's not. With deadly pathogens, including E. coli and salmonella, becoming a part of mainstream vocabulary, you could say farmers in California are also part investigator, spending a whole lot of time and money searching for what shouldn't be there. We're sampling, sampling, 60 samples per acre, okay, into a one composite sample. Every acre, we pull 60 samples. Samples that will indicate whether something potentially deadly is lurking on these leaves. The thing is, is we have taken, I think, over 300,000 samples in the last three or four years now uh, and not have one possible, not one uh, presumptive, not, not a single issue with pathogens. Not one problem, and there's a lot at stake. If there's so much as a hint of animals getting into the plants, a paw print or a bird dropping, the entire acre valued at $4,000 is destroyed. And one acre of lost revenue is nothing compared with what farmers are spending each month to keep our food safe. Just in raw product testing, we spend about $40,000 a month. In testing in this room, it's probably, it's about eight to $9,000 a month. We have 28 miles of eight foot high fence along the ranches. You're talking millions of dollars. Right. Just in mouse traps, we spent $250,000 last year. Tim McAfee is part owner of Rio Farms, the successful large scale operation that Bob Martin oversees. With 650,000 pounds of lettuce shipped each week to major customers like restaurant chains and bagged salad providers, one stray pathogen in this facility could make its way through the supply chain across dozens of states and into millions of mouths in a matter of days. And that's exactly why farmers in one of California's most prosperous agricultural regions are working alongside scientists at UC Davis, one of the world's most highly regarded public research universities. As you can imagine, this whole area of California is really one of the, the largest producers of lettuce and leafy greens for the whole United States. It's a, you could say, a success story in many ways. But on the heels of that success has been this growing concern about food safety. Unfortunately, a few outbreaks have been traced back to this area, so it's really motivated us at uh, WIFS, at the university, to really try and figure out what's going on with these outbreaks. WIFS is the Western Institute for Food Safety and Security at the University of California, Davis. Rob Atwill is the director here. 
The Institute is a partnership between UC Davis, government, and private industry, created to find answers to the many mysteries surrounding deadly pathogens. Yeah, one of our big questions right now, and a, a question a lot of scientists, a lot of the produce industry are asking, a lot of consumers are asking, is where does E. coli come from? They don't respect fences very well. So Atwill and a team of graduate researchers are working with the USDA at this field in Salinas, California. They're conducting experiments on a crop of lettuce planted solely for the sake of research. What we want to see is when we turn on the sprinklers, how the water will splash um, this to the lettuce heads that have been flagged. They're using a variety of methods to determine not only which animals are the most likely to carry disease, but also how it's transferred from the critter to the crop. So once you trap them, what do you do next? Uh, I take them to my uh, workstation, uh, get them out of the traps. I take measurements to identify them, uh, to see what species it is. I collect the sample and that sample get immediately shipped to the lab. A lab much like this one, where the bacteria are grown and studied and tested and tracked. So what you're doing is testing different methods and trying to rule them out until you narrow down the culprit. That's right. And until we narrow down the culprit, we have a difficult position to tell farmers exactly what to do in the cheapest way so that they'll adopt it up and down the valley. The results are used to provide farmers with ways to help protect their crop and, in turn, their customers. It's information they're eager to receive. Bob Martin realizes that one bad meal, one unfortunate outbreak, could have a devastating effect not only on his business, but the entire industry. The spinach that caused the outbreak was washed and bagged right here on August 15th. That's what happened in 2006 when a deadly strain of E. coli known as 0157H7 made its way across the U.S., not seen, smelled, or noticed until it was too late. The cramping and the diarrhea alone were so bad I had no idea that, you know, his kidneys could shut down. That was not even something that entered my mind. Tiffany Erickson's son, Regan, was four years old at the time that tainted spinach sent fear through the nation. You can tell that he's just, he's pale and puffy. The outbreak launched investigators into a search for answers to what exactly was making so many people sick. We realized something wasn't normal about this. I mean, I had gotten sick and was severely ill, and then Regan had gotten sick, and then Emma, and it was just this progressive, it wasn't your normal stomach flu. While both Tiffany and three-year-old Emma Erickson eventually recovered, Regan's symptoms worsened. It took days to find the answer. And the hospital fingerprint matched his E. coli with the spinach. It was a batch of spinach that Regan didn't even consume. Doctors suspect he contracted the deadly strain of E. coli 0157H7 by bathing in the same tub his mother had bathed in the night before while at her sickest. The pathogen spread throughout Regan's tiny body, taking its biggest toll on his kidneys. It's hard to be um, where I was, yeah, but I was there pretty long. He spent nearly a month in a children's hospital near his home in Salt Lake City, Utah, undergoing multiple blood transfusions and weeks of dialysis the bacteria came perilously close to winning. <laughs> Five years later, a shy nine-year-old still remembers the sadness he felt in the hospital and the joyful day when he finally came home. On the picture, she decorated, say, welcome home, Regan. How did that feel to come home? Happy. Hey, guys. Hey, buddy. How was school? Today, Regan Erickson is a third grader. Thanks for carrying Emma's backpack for her. With an extra close bond to his sister, Emma. She's a genetic match and perfect potential donor for a kidney. He's expected to need more than one transplant in his lifetime. But the Ericksons consider themselves lucky. Regan is still alive. This is the first part. We realize now how important it is to have family time, to go on family vacations, to take the moments now and hold on tight because you never know. 
The Ericsons are among the 48 million people each year hit with a foodborne illness. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates one in six Americans will contract a foodborne illness each year. 128,000 of them will be hospitalized, and 3,000 will die as a result. In 2011 alone, a new strain of E. coli killed more than 45 people in Europe and sickened thousands. In the U.S., Jenny O. Brands recalled turkey believed to be tainted with salmonella, which was also the culprit in a papaya recall. In Oregon, E. coli was discovered in strawberries. In Washington, it was Vibrio from raw oysters. Meantime, 3,000 cases of Dole salad bags were recalled after a random test found listeria. And speaking of listeria, in September it caused the deadliest outbreak of foodborne illness in the U.S. in more than a decade, when tainted cantaloupe claimed the lives of more than two dozen people. In August, another record was set when one of the largest meat recalls in history took place. Cargill pulled 36 million pounds of ground turkey that contained a drug-resistant strain of salmonella. This is an actual salmonella plate. This came from a rodent sample. Michelle J. Russell is a researcher and veterinarian with the Western Institute for Food Safety and Security at UC Davis. She was also an investigator with the California Department of Public Health during that landmark E. coli case in 2006, the same one that nearly killed Regan Erickson. While there had been other cases of E. coli recorded, the 2006 outbreak was unique in a couple of ways. For one, it was the deadliest outbreak in our nation's history to date, claiming three lives and sickening more than 200. But also, it was the first time investigators were able to track E. coli back to a specific processing plant on a specific date and eventually to the actual farm that was the source of E. coli here in San Benito County, California. What I would say broke the case were investigators in New Mexico and other states that actually went into patient refrigerators, pulled out leftover bags of spinach and found the DNA fingerprint, the matching outbreak strain in that bag. But in the meantime, the FDA had issued an unprecedented advisory not to eat spinach. It wasn't served in restaurants, it wasn't sold in grocery stores, and for those in the industry, it equaled tens of millions of dollars down the drain. But we were devastated, uh, and, and the growers that grow for us uh, were literally coming around the door and saying, what are we going to do with all the spinach that, that's ready for you guys to harvest? Jim Lugg, vice president of food safety and quality for the company that invented bagged salad, found himself facing the kind of crisis he had worked for decades to prevent. In effect, it shut down our, our spinach operation completely, even though we were not implicated in the outbreak. It's, it's everybody's nightmare that this could happen. These days, Bob Martin allows UC Davis researchers full access to his fields, where they test amphibians, rodents, and groundwater, looking for clues into what carries disease. Researchers now know what most likely caused the 2006 outbreak. Uh, there was a large population of wild animals, especially the feral pigs, that had access to these various fields. About one in every four fecal samples that we collected had E. coli 0157. Pigs, cattle, dirt, and creek water all tested positive. But the question remained, how do we prevent it? After that outbreak, the industry actually very quickly set up the California Leafy Green Marketing Agreement, which is voluntary standards, very specific descriptions of what growers and harvesters can do to make sure that outbreaks are, are prevented. Shortly after, in 2007, the Center for Produce Safety was launched at UC Davis. Jim Lugg, now retired, serves on its advisory committee. Obviously, people in our industry saw the need and they've stepped up and, and contributed through the Center for Produce Safety to, to really enhance the scientific foundation. And it's been a huge help for us. And in 2011, the historic Food Safety Modernization Act was signed into law. It's the first major reform to FDA food safety provisions in more than 70 years. It creates standards much like California's already stringent guidelines for the entire nation. The American consumer expects food to be safe. We've learned over time that we have to keep pushing the edge to keep improving food safety. If nothing else, 
because so many meals are served each year out of this region that there's a huge responsibility to do it right. While one team of researchers is focused on ensuring food safety, farther north on the campus of UC Davis, another is looking to make healthy foods not only safe, but enticing. One of the most important factors um, for consumption of foods and beverages is how it tastes, how it smells to us. And that's the, one of the biggest drivers of acceptance and preference and liking. Seems obvious if something doesn't taste good or look good, you won't want to eat it, no matter how good it is for you. Dr. Susan Ebler is delving into the very basics, searching for the actual chemical composition that makes food taste good. She's part of UC Davis's Viticulture and Enology program, housed in the Robert Mondavi Institute for Wine and Food Science. It's a state-of-the-art complex that's home to several facilities you won't find on most university campuses, including an energy-efficient winery, a state-of-the-art brewery, a vineyard, and a sensory lab. That would be A1. Now this is the type of lab you may expect to see. Here at the Ebler Lab, the focus is entirely on food at the molecular level. We're trying to better understand the flavor of melons so that we can have improved melon varieties with improved flavor, better flavor, uh, so that when the melons are harvested and transported uh, to the stores, the, the product that the consumer receives is a better quality, better flavor product. In short, she's searching for an end to the flavorless fruit and soggy produce you find when the product is harvested, stored, or shipped before it's ripe likely a result of the biochemical process of that plant being rudely interrupted. But if Dr. Ebler can identify the exact compounds responsible for the biochemical process, she might be able to find ways to keep it from screeching to a halt when the fruit is removed from the vine. And that could mean an end to tasteless tomatoes. But what machines can tell us about chemicals, only real life taste buds can tell us about flavor. And this is where the sensory lab comes in. The color tells us a lot about what we expect. It's going to be um, influenced by the texture. For example, a cracker. If it's mm -hmm. not crunchy, like we expect a cracker to be, mm -hmm. our perception of it is going to be very different. Do you need you. water or anything? Yeah, a little bit more water if you don't mind. Okay. The state-of-the-art sensory lab here at UC Davis has 24 stations where volunteers look at everything from taste to texture, sight to smell. On the day we visit, a panel is examining fresh figs. So when they arrive, first we'll have them come and smell the aroma references. Then we'll have them go to the tasting booths and they'll taste their fig samples and then they'll move to another booth to uh, do the visual assessment. There are three goals for this experiment. First, to identify flavor descriptions for different fig varieties, much like you see for wines. These sample aromas give volunteers a reference point for describing the figs. They could, for example, be grassy, oaky, or fruity. Second, the fig industry may use this information when developing new varieties that have a longer shelf life or more desirable characteristics. Yeah, number two. Thank you. Finally, sensory descriptions could be useful to bakers, food product developers, and chefs, like internationally known master chef Martin Yan. And the only thing that I need now is I want to have a beautiful fresh fig. Oh, this is beautiful. This is for garnishing. The author and host of Yan Can Cook invited us into his home to talk about three of his favorite things, gardening, cooking, and the science of food. Food science is very important, the study of the food chain from the farm, uh, from the original raw ingredient to the consumer market, whether they can be fermented, um, uh, whether they can be canned or frozen or dehydrated, all of these, each step are very important. What you buy in a tomato in, in the market is they're green and then put in the warehouse. They taste horrible. Right, they, they, they look beautiful, but they don't taste as good. So. And in his business, taste is everything. Yan says just like you might buy a Fuji apple because it's good with caramel, a chef might choose an ingredient, say a fig, because of the other ingredients those flavors might complement. 
To assist chefs like Yan, sensory testing could focus on textures or colors. The concept of a sensory lab is to identify the flavor profile and make sure everything tastes good and, 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 and when, when you do food manufacturing, you know what is good and what is acceptable, what is not acceptable by the general public. And I put them all together because I have something sweet, something a little bit tangy, and it's all fruit and all from California. Everything is grown right here. Flavor is very important just because, I mean, that's what makes you want to eat something. And if it doesn't have a good flavor, if it doesn't seem non-artificial, if it doesn't seem natural, I mean, you're not going to want to eat it. So flavor is the ultimate factor in everything. <laughs> And inside the Ebler lab, flavor is the focus, with an eye on better products and practices that will keep food tasty from the field all the way to the fork. Whoa, gently. It's a mission sought not only for the sake of science, but for the health of our nation by creating nutritional food we want to eat. If it tastes good, people will eat it. And if we want people to consume more fruits and vegetables, we need to make sure that they taste good. Improving the taste and quality of foods is, of course, an important focus for food scientists. But just as challenging are the issues that we as consumers can't always see. Problems that happen at the farm, sometimes the result of climate, environment, or plain old bad luck. We're looking at our record production ever of 1.95 1, 1 billion kernel pounds of almonds. When it comes to growing almonds, there's arguably no better place than California. 80% of the world's almond supply and 100% of the U.S. supply is grown in the valley regions of the Golden State. But as farmers increase their crop to meet demand, they face one potential problem. We've got these larger crops coming on. We're going to be extending the harvest uh, later into the fall, and obviously there's more risk of rain. And rain can create what's known as concealed damage. It's a problem growers have seen only a handful of times in recent history. But with a larger crop lasting well into the rainy season, they're expecting to see it more often. The damage occurs after the almonds have been shaken to the ground, where they're normally left to dry before harvesting. When they're drying on the ground and you get these successive rains, and you can't get in, you can't dry the crop, you can't get in to, to pick it up, you can't get in to, um, to deal with it properly. That's when the problems come. That's why almond growers have gone in search of a solution. Go, it may seem like a problem way. only Mother Nature could solve, but that's exactly the type of challenge food scientists so, okay. focus on. So you can see these almonds all look the same on the outside, yet when you open some of them up, they may open up to have concealed damage. So we're trying to help the industry understand ways of that they could actually measure concealed damage without having to open all of the almonds. If a solution is found and they say it looks promising, the result could save the almond industry millions of dollars. It would also carry on UC Davis's century-old tradition of creating new techniques and innovations that improve food quality and support California's food industries. We work with lettuce, we work with tomatoes, we work with peaches, we work with any commodity that's grown in the state of California. Olive oil, we have a big olive oil program here. And then we also do work with multiple industries, you know, everybody from Mars to Pepsi is involved in research here. As for almond growers across the state, finding a solution to their problem could mean peace of mind during harvest and a guarantee that they can continue to produce a very healthy product for an increasingly health-conscious society. Knowing these answers will help us manage uh, the concealed damage so that we are preserving the, the quality of a wholesome, nutritious, uh, highly desirable nut to eat. Preserving the quality of healthy foods, making them safer, more accessible, and more desirable. For researchers at the Western Institute for Food Safety and Security, that means protecting us all from dangers we can't see. For Sue Ebler, it means creating foods that taste good even through shipping and storing, so that more people will eat more food that's good for them. It's taste and aroma. We are at the analytical forefront of finding... And for Allison Mitchell, it means finding solutions to problems that affect our food supply, starting in the field. The goal is to produce higher quality foods, taking what we've got out there and making it even better and understanding it from the ground up. 
and that understanding is going all the way up to the top to those who lead the state in a state that leads the nation. Having the kind of technology and the science and the innovation that, that starts on a, a college campus somewhere and then ex extended to the end user is very much a part of why we are so successful in agriculture today. When you look at the productivity of a farmer back in 1930, maybe they fed um, 12 people. Um, and today, one farmer is responsible for the food source of 155 people. That's a productivity gain, that's an efficiency gain, that's from science, that's from technology. It's taking all the tools and deploying them in a way that has made us continually get better, to be more productive, and do it in a way that, that provides choice and affordability to our consumers. It's choice and affordability, coupled with life-changing innovation happening through these doors, in these fields, and under these microscopes. Innovation that has the potential to not only feed a nation, but fuel the world with food that is healthy and accessible and safe. To order a DVD copy of this program, call 888-814-3923 or visit kvie.org.